anecdotes, then I'll make general comments, and then I'll focus on uh, monetary economics as, uh, as it has been taught or could be taught. Uh, first, I, I heard Sebastian Geschert yesterday uh, presenting this, uh, this session, and he said he was very excited, he was hoping that people would put up uh, strategies about how to teach uh, alternative uh, views in various departments and uh, and then I realized well no I'm not talking about this here but then I thought oh but I talked about this two years ago at a conference that was organized by Jesper Jesperson so if you're interested in those strategies I have a text that was published by Jesper Jesperson and uh, Morgan's Madden in 2013 uh, about the, the anecdotes, I have a, a, a nice one, well, a, a bad one, I'll start with the bad one, and then a, a better one. Uh, the bad one is that when we were at the height of the uh, crisis, our graduate programs at the University of Ottawa were being reviewed. So there's somebody from McGill University who came to our department and then made some recommendations, and she was saying, uh, well, you, you know, you guys should have more mathematical, more math, more, more mathematical courses in, in your program. We already have a, a lot. <laughs> and so then I ask, well, how is that going to help our students to understand uh, the financial crisis that we're in? And there was a total silence, <laughs> deafening silence. So neither her nor my colleagues uh, replied anything. The second anecdote is that I was at the Canadian Economics Association meeting uh, a year and a half ago, and the topic was, well, what should be changed in teaching macroeconomics? So there was one person, his name is Christopher Reagan from McGill University also, who uh, said something r really nice. He said, well, now I have created a course on financial crisis, and I'm asking my students to read uh, Kindle Burger, uh, Minsky, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith. So I thought, well, that's great. The, it's having, the crisis is having some impact. On the other hand, the other two uh, panelists said, uh, well, you know, we're going to spend uh, maybe one more week on uh, the banking and financial system, but that will be it. That we, we won't change uh, anything else. So uh, I, I found that a little bit uh, discouraging. Now, uh, I hesitated, uh, as uh, Aslem knows, it took me uh, some time to come up with a title because at some point I wrote down as a title, Reform is not enough, there is no alternative, <laughs> drop economics and create a new field, something like radical political economy or economics. And then I thought, well, there is an urgent need for alternatives to the mainstream, but where will they be taught? Uh, so this sounds a little bit pessimistic, and it, just like uh, John McCombie said in the previous session, uh, he, he was a bit, wor he was rather worried about the future of alternatives. And I remember having a conversation with Paul Davidson 20 years ago, where he was very pessimistic about the future of post-Keynesian economics. But you know, 20 years later. Uh, he is still trying to uh, hang on to the Journal of post and Economics uh, and, uh, and he's still fighting uh, for <laughs> Keynesian economics. So, uh, you know, maybe every generation we, we are very worried about the future of heterodox economics, but maybe the future isn't that bad. Uh, I mean, since the 1990s, many journals have been uh, created. Uh, as uh, Oslem says, there, there are many movements uh, among, uh, among the students. Uh, a lot of new writers have appeared on the scene, are publishing papers. 
And uh, also, when I downloaded the paper of this conference, I was amazed uh, by uh, the, the quality of the papers, well, as much as I can assess by looking at them one minute each. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, w I was at one of the sessions of the, of the graduate students, and very good papers uh, were presented as well. Uh, on the negative side, uh, and this was pointed out by John McCombie, uh, it is, uh, I mean, departments now, uh, whether good ones or bad ones, uh, want us to publish in certain kind of journals, certain places. Uh, so, the, I, I would say there's a lot more pressure for youngsters to uh, publish in those journals uh, rather than publish in, in whatever journal they, they feel like. And the situation has, been, uh, has not been improved, it has been made worse by the generalization of all these national research quality exercises that started, I think, in Britain, but then were being used in Italy and in other countries. And this was pointed out by Fred Lee uh, and her, his co-author in 1998. And at the time, uh, you know, people were saying, well, Fred is exaggerating, he's uh, overly negative, but what he has written in 1998 proved right. You know, it, these exercises have been uh, very hard for heterodox economics. Uh, looking at the positive side, there are still some countries like Brazil where uh, heterodox economics is uh, still uh, doing well. Uh, there are, uh, there is some money now also flowing towards heterodox research like with the Institute the, for New Economic Thinking and the, one of the mandates of the Institute is to try to alleviate the fears of, uh, of young uh, scholars uh, to, to, to publish in, and work into a heterodox economics and have a successful career. Uh, unfortunately, if we look at the, the, the attempt to modify the teaching uh, from what I hear about the core project of Wendy Carline uh, being subsidized by INET, uh, the only thing that this will lead to is a change in the, how the stuff is being delivered to students, but there will not be uh, much change in the way, uh, well, in the content of, uh, of what she proposes. And uh, I was in Toronto at the INET conference last April, there was a presentation by uh, a, a colleague of hers and uh, this is, I, I got exactly the same impression as, for instance, Jamie Morgan, who wrote a report mm -hmm. uh, for the British Association for Heterodox uh, Economics. He, he, he was rather uh, disappointed in what was going on. Uh, the consensus among heterodox ec economists seems to be that there is no need for uh, revising uh, or rejecting mainstream economics and all that needs to be done is some slight improvement uh, are at the margin. Uh, Jamie Morgan in his report writes the, that the consensus seems to be that the current approach to macroeconomics modeling needs augmenting rather than repudiating. Um, I, I read recently a paper, a simple paper, written by the chief economist at the IMF, uh, Olivier Blanchard, and he argues that DSG models should be expanded to better recognize the role of the financial system, and he says that this is happening right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Blanchard, on the other hand, recognizes that these models are completely useless as long as you're not in the Great Moderation era. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you get out of the Great Moderation, uh, they, 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 cannot, uh, they, they, they cannot help you in any way. Uh, so, but he, he believes that that's all right, because he thinks that with the improvements being made to these models, that will keep the economy away from what he calls the dark corner uh, and uh, where, where mainstream models can provide no light. So, uh, well, 
The English call this wishful thinking. <laughs> um, there's a, a book that has uh, appeared called Big Ideas in Macroeconomics, where the author uh, gives an exposition of the macroeconomic extensions of the Arrow Debre McKenzie uh, model. And, uh, and this, you know, he thinks that that's really where all students should go. Uh, he says that this uh, downturn do not make a wholesale revamping of macroeconomics a bright idea. Uh, all, and again, all that is needed is to spend more time uh, on the role of banks and finance. Uh, he says it's technically difficult and this is why it takes time to, to do. And then he concludes in his book that the answers are not to be found in Keynes, Hayek, or Minsky, they are to be found in the neo-Walrasian model, where expectations about the future course of prices, and nothing else, are the driving force. Uh, so, the problem as I see it, and as I, I think others see it, is not that neoclassical economics could not predict uh, or forecast a subprime crisis, uh, I mean, myself, I was a close collaborator of Wynne Godley, and uh, I didn't pay any attention to what was going on in the real estate market in the U.S. around 2005, 2006, so I didn't predict anything either. Uh, but, you know, the, I think the problem from someone like myself who was not uh, fully brainwashed by neoclassical economics is that when I read those advanced textbooks, like the one by Wickens uh, or Galli, uh, other such books, is that one finds that there's an incredible number of uh, extraordinary unrealistic assumptions which are there, which are claimed to be simplifications or abstractions, when actually what they describe is a totally imaginary world that does not correspond whatsoever to the, the world in which we live. Um, orthodox econo economists, even many dissident orthodox authors, dress up their unrealistic foundations with realistic auxiliary hypotheses. And then the question is, you know, does that help to describe the real world? And, uh, and so, and in particular, you have the, the issue of how it, can money be integrated in those neo walrasian uh, models, and the answer being given in particular by Colin Rogers in an article that will appear in Egypt, the European Journal of Economics and European Policies, is uh, that, well, you can always introduce money, but it, it plays no role whatsoever. And the banks play no role whatsoever. It's if, if they are being introduced, it's completely ad hoc. Now, Caldor, in 1966, in 1972, uh, argued that it was not possible to add those realistic auxiliary hypotheses to a foundation of completely unrealistic uh, assumptions. Uh, so five minutes already? Yes. I've, I've talked all that 15 time. Fifteen minutes. Oh, no, I thought it was twenty. Yes, you have talked fifteen minutes. That oh, I've talked fifteen minutes. minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so where are you? You have all right. <laughs> okay, very good. So in that case, I'll come to uh, to the monetary economics thing. Uh, I thought so. <laughs> I, uh, it just, it just have, okay, what I wanted to do is, is look at two examples of textbooks, first year textbooks, and how they dealt with monetary macroeconomics. And, uh, and, and one of them is the, the textbook, first year textbook written by Neva Goodwin and uh, her co-authors. I only realized, because I had, um, done a book review of the first edition, and now they have a second edition, as Jonathan will explain. Uh, but I only realized 10 days ago that Jonathan Harris was one of the co-authors of, uh, uh, of the book, so I excuse myself uh, in advance for whatever critique I will do uh, of the book. Uh, first, I should say that there's a lot of good things in the book. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with that. <laughs> we all do. 
uh, they, you know, they spend, well, first they, they have a whole chapter devoted to the, the financial crisis. They, they emphasize uh, the role of inequality for the financial crisis. Uh, they, uh, they explain the role of the falling income of the middle class, the, the need to uh, go into debt for the, the middle class. Uh, so clearly the, the, the crisis had an impact on uh, what they wrote and also they had one chapter on money and banking, now it's, it's, it has been expanded to two chapters. Uh, however, if I come to the, the dark side of the book, uh, I mean, okay, what I want to say is that even heterodox authors are not heterodox enough. <laughs> Uh, they, they gave their full approval to the quantity theory of money, claiming that it explains inflation. There is no discussion whatsoever of the possibility of reverse uh, causation. Uh, we, uh, we are told a number of times that more deposits will allow banks to make more loans as if banks were merely uh, financial intermediaries and not uh, true banks. They further explain that quantitative easing increases bank reserves and hence the money supply because holding more reserves enables banks to offer more loans to the public and thus conclude that if quantitative easing was only moderately successful, it must be because banks remain reluctant to lend their excess reserves. So all these claims are completely inconsistent, for instance, well, they, it is consistent with what Basil Moore has called the verticalist story, but it's completely inconsistent with the way uh, post-Keynesian see things. Uh, there is a mainstream description in their book of the money multiplier in a fractional reserve banking system uh, with the supply of money and hence the supply of loans being determined by the creation of high-powered money through open market operations of the central bank. So the only difference with the standard story is that they discuss the uh, possibility of the uh, liquidity trap. So uh, I find this uh, rather annoying because now even central bankers recognize that uh, this is not at all the way uh, that banks and central banks uh, function. And, uh, and in fact, uh, you know, even central bankers are, are, are saying that, uh, for instance, the work of Basil Moore is a key contribution to monetary economics that stood the test of time. So his book was written 25 years ago. So I would think that after 25 years, other heterodox authors would take that uh, on board. Uh, another problem with, with their textbook, if we're linking fiscal policy with monetary policy, is that their, their chapter gives quite a lot of attention to uh, the mainstream crowding out effects, which are usually attributed to government deficits, you know, saying that they would raise interest rates. Uh, they do try to minimize the importance of these negative effects uh, when they argue that the interest elasticity of investment is small or when they argue that during a recession there is excess saving so that there are idle loanable funds out there that could provide finance for investment de despite the government deficit. So what they essentially do is that they concede the validity of the crowding out uh, argument and the loanable funds uh, theory, and what they do, they only try to restrict its effects. One minute. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, um, so to, the, to their merit, there is a brief discussion of the possibility of crowding in, uh, meaning that if the government provides uh, super highways and all that, public infrastructures, this will help. The, the private sector and should uh, induce the private sector to invest. But for instance, the macroeconomic argument of Kalecki that government deficits raise corporate profits uh, through a flow of funds analysis, this is not to be found 
in their book. So, uh, my purpose is not to, to criticize uh, the efforts of Jonathan Harris and his colleagues to create an alternative uh, textbook, but simply to say that they are not heterodox enough, uh, or at least they are less heterodox than a, a number of central bankers. <laughs> when, it, uh, when it comes to monetary theory. Okay, well, the, the, I'd like to conclude with another anecdote. Uh, myself, Mario Sekarecha, we wrote the Canadian version of the Bommel and Blinder first year textbook. In there, we have no money multiplier. We recuse uh, the, the fractional reserves banking system. And as uh, David knows, there's always five or six people who read every chapter of your first year textbook. So the feedback we got was that, oh, those are really good chapters, but couldn't you add, you know, at least in an appendix, uh, something about the money multiplier? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we, we turned it down because to us, either you, you believe in the post kantian story, or the, and then if you, if you believe in the post kantian story, then the money multiplier is completely uh, inconsistent with that. So you cannot have both. You cannot have the post kantian story about how banks and the central bank function and, yes, and, uh, and, and introduce a money multiplier story. But then, uh, the, whereas the uh, Goodwin and Harris textbook is now in its second edition, our book uh, <laughs> has only a first edition. We never got the second edition. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh <laughs>